fun day to be here, uh, especially with our guest, Wayne Royce, and uh, he just shared with us uh, from 9 o'clock a lot of information that just uh, put a smile on our faces, and it's great to see all the things that have happened in South Africa, and I was uh, reminiscing, thinking about your coming, and maybe you'll remember, uh, Wayne came in the first year I was here for deputation. It was the spring of 2001. I came in 2000, July, and he came in spring of 2001 to present the vision that you had for where you were going. And uh, so, and, and here we are, Wayne, 21 years later. Yeah, a older. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it's it's a blessing to have him back with us, and, and you're going to really enjoy uh, the time with him. And many of you have seen Wayne off and on throughout the time, and others are new to him, but uh, you're in for a real treat. And so it'll be a real blessing. Um, let's see. Somebody's celebrating a birthday today. Emily Wallace, right? And uh, the kids knew that, right? Today's mommy's birthday. The smiles on their face let us know. And Ed's smiling too, right, Ed? This is a great day. So let's give a round of applause. Happy birthday. And then, um, let's see. Uh, the handouts that we have on the table down by Doug Whitmore. Um, also has a handout from the Lighthouse Station. That's our local pregnancy ministry in Warsaw. And in that group of information, there's a lot of updates on abortion in our country that they've included. And so it'll be very informative, so I encourage you to read it. And um, like I say, it's interesting reading. And then... Um, Next Sunday, we'll start our Sunday school class back up, and that'll be meeting back here at 9 a.m. next Sunday. Um, and then, I think only one other thing I need to pass along, and that is that um, Denise's brother, Warren, Denise Madison, her brother, Warren, has possibly had a stroke. And so... Um, requesting yes, prayer for him, okay? So requesting prayer for him. So other than that, I don't have anything else to pass on to you. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful and grateful for your kindness to us today and especially the chance we have to gather and worship and remember and think about all the ways that you've helped us throughout the week and your, your blessings in our lives. We're also grateful and thankful for our guest today, Wayne Royce, for his ministry and his family's ministry there in South Africa. And we look forward to the things that he'll share with us this morning. And then, Father, we pray for Warren. Uh, we would ask that you would help him in his time of need, and we pray that he'll be able to recover with your help. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to accomplish, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our first hymn that we're going to sing is number 575. 575. And then when you find your place, I'll ask you to join me in standing. Okay, number 575.
Jack, you got your hand up. I would like to thank everybody that helped out and worked behind the scenes and worked in the scenes for my mother's memorial service yesterday and the luncheon afterwards. Thank all the ladies. Thank Reverend Duff and Claudette for their support and Beth Caden and everybody else that that had a hand in everything and made it possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Yesterday was a memorial service for Jack and also Linda's mom, Winnie. And so it was our pleasure to be able to do that survey. Okay, and then I was going to say we recorded Wayne's uh, presentation between 9 and 10. We're putting this out on TV. So you'll be on TV. Uh, Guy will get it up and running. So if you weren't here earlier at 9 o'clock, It'll be up there so you can watch and you'll be very informed about the Ministry of South Africa. He also showed slides and those will also be up there. So that's a great opportunity to go to YouTube is, is the outlet and punch in Rockland Baptist Church and it'll bring it right up. And uh, so I can't promise you it'll be on early today, but probably by this evening it'll be there and you can get a glimpse of what Wayne shared earlier. And so without any further ado, Wayne, come on up and share with us out of God's word. Yeah, I know, I didn't want to make you nervous. <laughs> See how you are? That's right. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for um, just your prayers and support and encouragement over the years and uh, you know, uh, Way back at the beginning, Pastor said it's 21 years ago this spring. Yeah. Uh, so just over 21 years ago that I came here um, the first time. And I guess at that particular time, um, well, I guess the Lord must have given us some kind of an idea where we were going and what was because because uh, you believed it mm -hmm. and we believed it. And now we can look back and say praise the Lord for um, for his goodness to us. But you know, uh, there's a lot of, but I, am I supposed to speak? No, you? you're okay. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, you'll still be hurt. I, I tend to. You're fine. I tend to do You'll this. still be hurt. Okay? Yeah, 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 you're okay fine. if I do this? Yeah, we're okay. good. We're good. All right. Um, you know, in the, uh, in the New Testament, you know, there's uh, uh, Lord Wearsby writes a series of books, and he, he titles each of the books of the New Testament, you know. Uh, and, and in the Old Testament, he does the same, you know, uh, be wise, you know, Proverbs and, you know, and different things like that. And uh, be rich is Ephesians and, you know, things like that. But um, uh, in, uh, in, in Philippians, he, he uh, says, be joyful. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the title that he gives to it. And I think that the book of Philippians and in... in uh, Probably the book of Philippians has shaped my understanding um, more than anything else as far as as a missionary. Uh, it has shaped how I, um, how I approach missions, but how I approach missions primarily in the sense of our relationship with you. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, thank you for... Uh, partnering with us these years. But uh, as we get started, I've mentioned the book of Philippians. What I would like to do is um, I'd like somebody to just quote a verse in Philippians. Well, just any verse in Philippians. Caught you off guard, didn't I? <laughs> the truth of the matter is, is you know more of them than you think. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is that in Philippians? Very good. <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 13. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so now we're over on this side of the room. Okay. Anyone? I'll try. Be anxious for nothing but by every... Uh, like Very good. Do you know where it is? No, I 
four, six, and seven. Yeah, very good. I'm oh, proud of you. Okay, so now we're back at this side. Yes, ma'am. One, one twenty-two or twenty-one. Yep. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Very good, very good. Now we're back over here. <laughs> Anyone? You guys know I'm coming back. <laughs> Can we look at our Bibles? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. How about being confident of this very thing? That he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Very kind. Do you know where that's found? <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 6. Very good, very good. Okay. I give you one more chance. You guys want one more chance over here? Or are we good? Are we good? How about this? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Oh, very four, good. Four, 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 four. Yep, four, four. So I guess we are back over here. <laughs> you should have answered the question when you had your chance. <laughs> Anyone? By your graciousness be known to everyone, the Lord is near. For these four fellows. Uh, five, I think it is, yeah. Before the, yeah, very good. I wasn't expecting that one. That's, that's a little unusual. Are you a little unusual? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? One more chance. One more chance. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who knowing that the form of God, do not think of Robert T. who of God, but made himself to know. And you know these verses, you know. And sometimes we're familiar with these passages of Scripture. We're very familiar with them, but just off the top of our head, you know. Um, but what I'd like to do um, is I'd like to go back, 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 and I'd like to just share some thoughts from Philippians as far as uh, missions, okay? Because I think that the real, the real topic of the book of Philippians is the joy of working together in the gospel ministry. I believe that that's what Paul, from Paul writing to the Philippian church, I believe that that's what he is expressing, is the joy that we have in working together in, uh, in the gospel ministry. Uh, and Paul, as, as he writes this letter in, in chapter 1, you know, Paul and Timotheus, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to the saints which are in Christ Jesus at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. His typical greeting that he gives there. Uh, and then in verse 3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, if he who began a good work in you will perform it, perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ, on the day of Christ Jesus. And, and um, in that in that opening, he mentions a, uh, several different things. Then in, in verse 9, he goes on to say, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in judgment and, and uh, discernment, and that you may approve the things that are excellent. And so... Um, that you may be filled with the fruit of righteousness. So how he's praying for them. So in this first chapter, he's mentioned at least three or four different ways that he is praying for them. Um, and then in verse 12, he says, But I, I would that you would understand, brethren, if the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, or some translation, some of the newer translation, unto the progress of the gospel. And uh, so the thought that uh, that we present, you know, is um, because back in verse 5, he said, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Then in verse 12, he says uh, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. And so the thought that we present, and, uh, and I, I think it's really a standing thought, is what is this fellowship of the gospel that God uses to further the gospel. Um, what is this partnership in the gospel that God uses so that the gospel makes its progress in this dark world? And that is a thought, I think, that 
uh, is presented to us in this first chapter. Um, and I believe that Paul, in various ways, answers the question through the letter, through this book. This hundred and what, six verses, 111 verses, something like that. You know how many there is? Something about like that. Um, how does Paul answer that question in this letter? And that's what we want to just take, a, take some time and, and consider uh, this morning. <laughs> What is the, uh, what is that, for that fellowship of the gospel, that partnership of the gospel, that God turns and, and somehow, in his grace, he turns and uses it to further the gospel, to shine the gospel of Jesus Christ into the dark corners of this world. And I think that we can probably, as we look through this letter, we can identify that there's there's four things that I think that we see in this letter. The first is the fact that in verse 5 he says, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Uh, that this is a partnership, a fellowship of persistence. In other words, faithfulness is involved. And I remember in 2008-9 during the great economic collapse of the world. Remember when that happened? And many missionaries over on the field um, had to come back to the states because uh, their supporters were not committed. Um, and, uh, and, and so people asked if we were going to have if we were going to have to come back. And uh, we and, and what we realized is the churches like yourself that were supporting us, even in even in your financial difficulties, you had a commitment. We have promised this before the Lord, and we are committed to this. And we don't take this lightly. And so uh, our churches tend to be of this sort, that missions is a serious business. It's not just something, well, you turn the switch on, you turn the switch off. You turn the switch on, you turn the switch off. And, uh, and I, I thank you. Because even in those times like that, you continue uh, to, to support us. And we were able to stay on the field and continue the work that God had sent us to do. And so it was for, for the Philippians that they had been, they had participated with Paul from the first day. And you remember way back in those early days when Paul left Philippi and he went past those two A cities. I don't remember what Apollonia and or whatever the other one was, we'll say Attica. Was that we know Attica? Okay. And he ended up he ended up in Thessalonica. But then from Thessalonica he went on to Berea. Then from Berea he goes out to Athens and then to Corinth, where uh, Silas and Timothy join up with him. But even after that he continued on. He goes back to Jerusalem. He makes a journey through Galatia and he ends up at Ephesus, starting the church at Ephesus from there for three years. And so. Um, the, the, the Philippian believers had participated with him in various ways from that first day even until now, about 12 or 15 years later. Now specifically, Paul here in verse 12 is referring to his uh, the last four or five years. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, after the third missionary journey, he's going to Corinth and he's going to take the collection for the Jerusalem saints. He comes to Philippi, and they say, oh, what brings you to town? And the Apostle Paul says, well, you know, the Corinthians promised a year ago to give to help the, um, the Jerusalem saints, and so I'm going down to Corinth uh, to take the collection and going back to Jerusalem to deliver it. And the Philippian believers said, well, why can't we give? We want to give. And so they did. But that was the last time they saw the Apostle Paul. Since then, he had gone up to Jerusalem, and he had been arrested. But when he was on the Temple Mount, he got to stand up and, in Hebrew, speak to the crowds in the Temple complex of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was, everything was going good. You know the one word that changed it all? As soon as he said, Goyim, the Gentiles, that was it. This man deserves to die. And so it was from there. 
Then he goes to, he ends up in Caesarea. And he had the opportunity to speak in Caesarea. He had the opportunity to speak to Governor Felix and Governor Festus and King, Bernice, uh, uh, King Agrippa and his wife Bernice. He had the opportunity to speak to them about righteousness and about Christ. He goes, we go on from there and we find him uh, going across the Mediterranean Sea and we see these centurions here and there, these centurions that Paul interacted with. And every single one of them was influenced in different ways by their time with the Apostle Paul. And even when he came to Rome, he comes to Rome and it says at the end of the book of Acts, for two years, everyone that came to him, Paul was able to preach the gospel freely. He had his own private security force, the Praetorian Guard. No one was going to interfere with him preaching the gospel. The Praetorian Guard would see to that. But notice what he goes on to say here in verse 13. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ, my, my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So that the whole Praetorian Guard heard the gospel through the Apostle Paul. The ones that were chained to him, you know, and when they got back in the barracks, you know, they'd get back there and some of the soldiers say, man, I can't believe it. I was chained to that guy and all he did was preach the gospel all day long. All he did was tell me, I'm a sinner and I need to get saved. That's all he did all day long. But along the way, as they're sharing these things, the echoes of the gospel and the reason for Paul's imprisonment echoed through the chambers of the Praetorian Guard. So that many of them, but he also goes on to say that, uh, and, and everywhere else, and others had heard because Paul was there in prison. So whoever came for two years, the Praetorian Guard that was chained to Paul day and night, the people that came and went, even to the point where he goes on to say in chapter 4, verse 20, as he's sending his final greetings, he sends his final greetings in chapter 4, verse 20. Uh, 21. Uh, greet every saint in, 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 in Christ. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Now, Caesar's household could be, it could be the servants of the palace. It could be the Roman, uh, it could be the Roman guards that were chained to him. They certainly heard. Uh, it could be some of Caesar's own family members. We have no record in history at this stage in Roman history that any of Caesar's family got saved. But just because secular history doesn't tell us about it doesn't mean it's not true. It could be. But we know there were some in Caesar's own household that had come to faith at this time. So, though Paul was... Uh, Paul was arrested, and though he was carried across the Roman world, across the Mediterranean Sea, and landed in Rome, the gospel had continued to go forth. And so he just telling the flip it, hey, you know, since, since four or five years ago when I was there, the things that have happened, God is still using them to further the gospel. So it had continued from the first day that he left Philippi, even to the present time in Rome, the gospel had continued to go forth. Oh, that greater progress of the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel. Interesting that it's a military term. And it's a military term that, that is used, uh, uh, I think the, the best way that I understand it is in, in Julius Caesar's war memoirs, he talks about the time of the the German, the German barbarians were coming across the Rhine. They would, they would float their little boats across the Rhine, and they would harass the Gallic tribesmen that were allied to Rome. So Julius Caesar decided to march his legions to the Rhine River. So he marches his legions to the Rhine River, and he says that as they were standing on this shore, they could look across the Rhine, and they could see the German barbarians on the other side. And the German barbarians were bold very bold and coming right to the shore because they knew there's no way that these Romans can cross this the mighty Rhine River. And so Julius Caesar sent his three legions to work. And I think it was a week or ten days, not only they had built a bridge across the Rhine River, 
he had marched his legions across that river and the barbarians fled. That was the pioneer advancement of the Roman army. They had gone to a part of the uh, ancient world they had never been before. And that's how the term would be used. What Paul is saying is that there's been this strategic advance of the gospel into, out into the dark corners of this Roman world through your participation with me. You have helped me take the gospel into these dark corners where it never would have gone otherwise. Amazing. Yeah. Not only was it a fellowship of persistence, but it was a fellowship of prayer. <laughs> Look down to verse 19. I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, what does that mean? And our, our sister already shared with us verse 21. We're going to refer to that here in just a minute. But Paul is basically giving a picture here that um, through their supplication, through their prayer, uh, the word supplication here literally means a specific prayer, a specific request brought before God. And so he's saying, through your prayers, your supplications, the specific request that you bring to God, God will supply me with the Spirit and save me in this present situation. So literally, Paul is picturing that their prayers lead the pioneer advancement of his salvation. Or literally, as they pray... God will do something that will lead to his salvation. So then you ask, well, you know, that's interesting. But what is Paul really saying he's going to be saved from? Is he talking about being saved from sin? Well, no. Obviously, he was saved back in Acts chapter 9. Salvation, deliverance. Uh, what is he being talked about saved from? Maybe he's talking about being saved from the threat of death. Because in the Roman world, when you were uh, accused of treason, as Paul was, and you stand before Caesar, you stand before Caesar, and you're either going to get the thumbs down or the thumbs up. Which one is better? Okay, we know, thumbs up. But then our sister has reminded us, for Paul, for me to thumbs up is life, but the thumbs down is gain. So Paul's not talking about being saved from the threat of death, is he? Because for Paul, not in that, but down in verse 25, he says, uh, he's convinced that uh, he will remain, he will continue uh, with them so that their progress in the gospel might continue. So Paul is not talking about dying uh, because to him, that's gain. You know, the Roman world, it's thumbs down, but to Paul, that's thumbs up. Well, they're not talking about maybe, maybe. Shlaumbi is the closest word for maybe. Shlaumbi. Maybe Paul is saying, well, you know, I've been unjustly imprisoned. I shouldn't even be here. And maybe, you know, he's, he's saying, well, pray that, I, that I'm released from this prison, this imprisonment. You know, if you were, if you were arrested tomorrow for whatever reason, for treason. And you say, well, I haven't done anything. I shouldn't be here. Wouldn't you want to get out? Of course you would. But that's not what Paul's talking about because he goes on to say that he's convinced. In verse 25, we just read it. He's convinced he will be released and he will come to them. We read verse... <clears throat> Where are you? Right here. If I am to, if I am to live, abide and remain in the flesh... This will mean, in verse 22, this will result in uh, fruitful labor for me. Fruit for your, uh, your, in, in your account. So Paul is saying, you know, I'm convinced I'm going to get out of here. And I'm going to come to you. And coming to you, I will bear fruit among you. So he's not talking about being saved from sin. That happened back in Acts uh, Act chapter 9. In chapter 2, he's going to... Uh, he's going to refer to that again in chapter 3. He's going to describe that. Hmm. He's not talking about being saved from the threat of death because that's, that's not the issue here. 
He's not talking about being saved from this unjust imprisonment because he's convinced that that's going to happen eventually. He doesn't know when, but it will happen. So what exactly is he asking them to pray for? Now, to be honest with you, they have to have something specific to pray for if, God, if they're going to be able to identify the answer. That would be like me praying for, you know, pray for me. Well, what do you want me to pray for? Well, Paul is saying here that through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit 